Then the archaeologists started to take a look in detail at the drill marks on that hole. And what they discovered was a huge anomaly, that that was drilled with a stable, fixed drill. And it was drilled at extremely high speed. It's a, this is thought to be 40 or 50,000 years old. There is not supposed to have been any such technology in that period that was capable of drilling with a stable fixed drill. And yet there it is and, and, and there it appears. So there, there are also in incredible, very fine uh, needles, bone needles that the Denisovans made, very long ones, which suggest that they were stitching very heavy stuff together. And the suggestion has been, were they making skin boats, for example, to, to use to navigate? That would explain how they managed to get themselves to Australia, uh, mm. which is where the largest amount of Denisovan DNA uh, sur sur survives today. There's one of those, there's one of those needles. So there, there, there are indications of strangely out of place technology amongst the Denisovans, which is 20, 30,000 thousand years earlier in the human story than it than it should be those kind of needles that kind of bracelet you could expect to find them in what archaeologists call the neolithic but to find it in the paleolithic is very puzzling and and, and very odd and it suggests that the denisovans were certainly not uh, shambling sub subhumans that they they were refined creatures can you find out what year they discovered the denisovans jamie can you google that real quick i, I, I want to say it's in the 2000s but i mean ima imagine that human beings have been around for this long here we are in 2019 and within the last decade or so mm. they figured this out yeah we're, d we're discovering new stuff about ourselves. we're discovering that our story is much richer much more textured much more layered than we thought it was it's not a simple story it's a very complicated story and we ourselves are a hybrid species. We are we are the result of interactions with all kinds of different looking human beings, and the end the end result is ourselves. So it's not just that we carry Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA. In a sense, we are Neanderthals yeah. and Denisovans. Uh, you know, and have have uh, they they are part of the anatomically modern uh, human human heritage. So. You make a good point. The fact that this is only being discovered now and that it's an incredibly important, I mean, it, it completely rewrites the story of our ancestry. The notion... the that notion 1970s. 1970s. The, oh, okay, I'm the, way off. The real work that's been done in Denisova Cave has been done in the 2000s, from, from 2006, 2007 onwards. Genetic examinations. That, that's when the stuff. major papers have been... 2008, there ...have been published, yeah. uh, which have, which have re revealed the genome of the Denisovans and revealed the Denisovan connection to, to anatomically modern humans. Mm. The fact that we're only finding this out now that we, that we told the story of our past and weren't aware of this raises the question how much else in the story of our past is there that we're not aware of let's stop being so arrogant so sure of ourselves so confident in our findings let's be more tentative let's keep an open mind and see and see where it takes us that's that's the main me message that i have from from all of this and i think um and i hope that this will be an effect of this book i'm not I'm not kidding myself that the archaeologists are going to jump on board uh, overnight, particularly so since I'm very critical of American archaeology uh, in this book. And I'm critical of it specifically and explicitly because of the dominance of the Clovis First model for mm. so long, which prevented other research taking place. And I have to say, archaeologists like to insult me by calling me a pseudoscientist. I can't think of anything more pseudoscientific than the Clovis First Doctrine, which locked American archaeology for 50 years in a particular framework, which we now know was totally wrong. Nothing good about it at all. A, com a complete mistake. What I'm hoping the book will do uh, in the long run is that it will lead to more attention being focused on the Americas. This is a very neglected area of the world uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. I'm, it's, the recent history of the Americas has been relatively well studied, but the deep and ancient history has not been, has not been well studied. And I think America is going to contain revelations for us about our story and about our past. And I'm serious when I, when I suggest that America is the most plausible and the most likely 
home base for a lost civilization. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. You, need a, you can't have it on a small island. There's got to be a large landmass with enormous resources and the ability for population to grow and for those resources to be, to be mobilized. And what I suddenly realized, you asked earlier why I, why I started to write this book at all, is what the new evidence is pointing to is that the Americas have been wrongly neglected, that here we have a giant continental landmass with extraordinary resources that has just been ruled out of the story of human civilization. But once we take account of the fact that there was a giant cataclysm over North America 12,800 years ago, and once we start looking, as I do in America before, at the incredible deep in-depth similarities between, for example, the religious system of ancient Egypt and the religious system of the Mississippi Valley, then you realize that you're into a, into a global mystery here and that the answer to that mystery may not at all be in the old world and may very much be uh, in, the, in the Americas. See, it's odd. I mentioned Moundville earlier on. It's kind of odd that we should find uh, what is essentially the ancient Egyptian religion uh, manifesting in the symbolism of Moundville, the ascent to Orion, the transit to the Milky Way, the journey along the Milky Way. Very, these are very specific and, and idiosyncratic ideas. And what makes it doubly odd is Moundville isn't that old. Moundville as a site is about a thousand years old. Ancient Egypt had already been gone completely from the world uh, for at least 600 years before Moundville was created. The end of ancient Egypt, there's, there's Moundville. And uh, w w what we're looking at in the foreground is Mound B and we're looking at Mound A in the, in the, in the distance um, and, and a complete circle of mounds. What, what is odd about it is we find this system of ancient Egyptian ideas in Moundville 500 years after ancient Egypt has gone from the world. Uh, the, the, Romans, the, the, the Romans were the end of ancient Egypt. By 400 AD, ancient Egypt is gone. Moundville doesn't even exist then, but 600 years later, it is created and it manifests the entire set of ancient Egyptian ideas. Clearly, it did not get that as a result of direct transmission from ancient Egypt unless they were time travelers. The only way I think it could have got it is as a result of a legacy passed down from a much earlier civilization that had been influenced and affected many different parts of the world. And the characteristics of that civilization, the, the shamanistic heart of it, the use of altered states of consciousness, the focus on those, are amongst the reasons that I would suggest that America is the place that we should be looking. And the big mysteries are in the areas that were so devastated at the end of the last ice age, up in the north of North America, the channeled scablands in particular, and then the Mississippi Valley, the whole story of the Mississippi Valley. Yes, Moundville is a thousand years old, but then you can go back to Poverty Point in Louisiana, which is 2,700 years old. You can go to Watson Break in Louisiana, which is 5,000. 500 years old. You can go to sites like Conley, which are 8,000 years old. The system keeps on going back.